Hello everyone. Welcome to the talk on detecting spam reviews at scale using Apache Spark and Jon Snow Labs NLP on Databricks. A little bit about me. I am Debu Sinha. Currently I work as a senior solutions architect at Databricks focused on ML and AI. Before joining Databricks, I have worked as a senior solutions architect at Lifion by ADP. Before that, I was a tech co-founder for Throttle Onboarding, which is in the ad tech space. I have also spearheaded many big data and ML initiatives as a senior software engineer and architect at VFL Group and Bank of America. I have completed my master's from Johns Hopkins University in computer science with a research thesis on machine translation. In today's talk, we will first understand what spam reviews are, what are the business impacts of spam reviews, what are the typical steps involved in creating a data science solution to detect spam reviews. We will also take a look at the reference architecture and finally go into a hands-on demo that will demonstrate how you can construct an NLP capable data processing pipeline at scale in your organization. So what is a spam review? Any fake or untruthful review to promote or damage the reputation of a product, brand, service, or individual. Here are some of the facts related to the business impact of fake reviews. Some of the key points here are the businesses or products with 1 to 1.5 stars out of 5 make about 33% less revenue than an average enterprise. 50% of customers question the quality of the company or product with negative reviews. 57% of the customers won't use a business with fewer than four stars. You might have seen these headlines in the news. On Amazon, the top selling sellers were soliciting reviews in exchange for refunds. An investigation by which uncovered review factories are operating through Facebook groups to write five star reviews. Here are some more interesting facts. A survey done by Bright Local in 2020 uncovered that more than 60% of the customers check online reviews at least once a week to find a local business that they want to do business with. People trust reviews written for a product business more throughout the different platforms that are available. Hopefully these facts and figures help you understand the importance of tackling the problem of a spam reviews. Spam review detection is an area of continuous research. I have attached links to some of the articles at the end of the deck. Let's now understand the steps involved in building an end-to-end -end spam review detection system. So a typical data science problem has the following three steps. Data engineering, here we ingest the raw data set into secure data lake. Here we standardize and clean the data to make it discoverable by the data scientist. The next step is the data science step in which the data scientists use the clean data sets and aggregate them, perform some data visualization, tune and train various ML models to select the best one and lastly productionize the model. During the productionizing of the model, the model code is translated to production ready form and then monitoring and governance are applied to them. Also the data engineering pipelines that are responsible for ingesting the raw data into tables or the clean format are also production, productionized. Here is a typical modern data lake architecture. On the left hand side are your sources of raw reviews which can be in the form of text or JSON. There Review, these reviews might be coming from a stream or batch system and is loaded into your cloud storage. This is where the Apache Spark on Databricks simplifies the consumption of these raw datasets into Delta table. Apache Spark unifies the code to consume data from batch and streaming sources and Delta format provides optimized asset compliant storage. Delta also allows multiple writers to append simultaneously to a Delta table and provide all the downstream readers with the most recent data view. MLflow is another open source component that is integrated and fully managed by Databricks 
to manage the end-to-end -end life cycle of your ML projects. John Snow Labs NLP is an open source tech processing library for Python, Java, and Scala. It provides production grade, scalable, and trainable version of the latest research in natural language processing. Let's take a deeper look into each of these individual components now. The first on the list is the Databricks Lakehouse platform. The original creators of Apache Spark founded the company Databricks. Since then, the company has been continuously innovating new products. Delta Lake, MLflow, and Koala's projects are developed and open sourced by the Databricks community. The Databricks Lakehouse is a simple, open, and collaborative platform. It is cloud agnostic and provides an efficient data management and governance layer powered by Delta Lake. Databricks enables data engineering, BI SQL, real-time analytics, and data science and ML use cases within a single managed platform. For today, let's focus on the ML capabilities of the Databricks platform. Databricks at its core support Spark ML. However, you can also use your favorite ML framework like sklearn, TensorFlow, Keras, H2O, and many more on Databricks. Databricks also supports running single node ML workloads. The ML run come with most of the latest releases of the ML framework. There are also new features that are actively being worked on like AutoML and Feature Store. The core feature of ML offering at Databricks is the tight integration with MLflow that provides model tracking, governance, and deployment in a simple intuitive way. Let's take a look at the MLflow components. On the left hand side, you have the MLflow models. MLflow models help in the deployment of machine learning models in diverse serving environment by abstracting the internal framework in a way that if you want to exchange one framework with another in future, it can easily be done without affecting the downstream application or pipeline. MLflow tracking allows you to record and query experiments. It acts as a repository for code, data, config, and results for your MLflow experiments. Next is the model registry. Model registry is the centralized managed repository for your models, where you can then manage the life cycle of each and every model that was trained. You can promote them from one environment to another, like from staging to production to archive. MLflow also provides you with multiple deployment options for your machine learning model. You can either deploy the MLflow model as a Docker container or as a batch or stream inference on the Databricks environment using the PySpark UDF. Or you can also create a REST endpoint either on the Databricks environment itself or through the integration through Azure ML and AWS SageMaker. Now you should have a good understanding about the different components of the reference architecture. Let's dive into the demo. All the code that you're going to see right now in, a, in the demo is available on my GitHub profile. I will be providing the link to this project so that you can utilize it and then run it end to end on your own environment. If you are an existing customer of the Databricks workspace, then you must be familiar with having your own Databricks environment where you can spin up a cluster. If you are new to Databricks, you can also sign up for a community edition. The link to that is also available in the deck itself. So within the Databricks environment, like when you log in, you will be welcomed into the Databricks home screen. Here, you can simply go in and first create a cluster. So go into the compute tab and then here click on create cluster. Here simply you can select a single node CPU cluster for the purpose of this demo. Like when you're running the notebooks that I'm providing, you can do that. Here you can give any name to your cluster that is meaningful and select the ML runtime and 8.4 ML with the Scala 2.12 and Spark 3.1.2 support. This is it. For the purpose of executing the notebooks, this is enough. 
I already have created a cluster, a single node cluster that is available for me. So here, if I look at it, spam filter, it's available. It is i32x large and it's ready to go because it's green. So now I can go back to my workspace. There are two ways of importing the notebooks from my GitHub repository here. I, if I don't have access to the repos functionality as I am using the community edition, I can simply go in workspace into my home directory and then right click and say import. And now I can drag and drop my notebooks one at a time here and click on import. In initially, you will have to download just the two notebooks like the 00 underscore setup.py and 01 underscore deceptive opinion filter using John Snow Labs. Like this is, these two are the only files that you need to download and import into the Databricks environment. If you are familiar with the repos environment, then you can create a GitHub token and add it to your workspace. That will allow you to directly pull the project, entire GitHub project into your Databricks workspace. So now you have access to the entire repository and you can perform Git actions like commit and pull directly from the GitHub, uh, from Databricks environment. So let's take a look at the notebook. 01 deceptive opinion, this is the main notebook. And 00 underscore setup has some pre-configurations that are needed to run this demo. In order to start execution of the notebook, a couple of things we need to keep in mind. First of all, the cluster that we started should be up and running and connected to our notebook. So here, if my notebook was not attached to any cluster, it will be in a detached state at first. So I click on it and I will select the cluster that I just created. Once it is available, I can start executing my notebook. So as you can see here, the requirement for the Databricks runtime here is 8.4 ml. We have to install a Java library for com.johnsnowlabs.nlp. This is a Maven coordinate for Spark NLP, and it is very easy to install it on the cluster. So we simply take this from here, we copy it, we go back to our cluster. If you go on compute, select our cluster, I go in libraries, and with one click, I can say install a new library choose maven there and paste the entire string that we copied there. So this way it will install the Jon Snow Labs NLP library onto our cluster. This is a cluster scope library. So any notebook which has uh, which is in connected to the cluster will have access to it. Going back to the notebook, I also need to install Spark NLP which is a Python library because I'll be using the Python wrapper for it. So Databricks provide you with another option to manage Python libraries, that is notebook scope libraries. And the benefit of using notebook libraries is that when you do a pip install, percent pip install and a library name on the Databricks environment, it allows you to install, say, Spark NLP 3.2 version just for this notebook. And if another user is connected to my cluster and they are looking to use another version of library, it will be a different configuration altogether and they won't conflict with each other. So a little bit about this notebook. So this notebook, again, we are going to build an end-to-end -end ETL pipeline that takes as input the raw reviews in text format for hotels. They are labeled as either they fake or real and they have been collected through a research, uh, like they were part of a research done by students and faculties at Cornell University. You can read more about it in the papers listed here. Next, the architecture diagram that we already have gone through. So here we are going to use this data engineering step to read the raw files from the GitHub repository and paste it into my data lake. And once the files are available or the raw data set is available in the data lake, I will simply convert them into the delta format and perform my data science steps on top of it. 
So here I can simply call my second notebook 00 underscore setup, which essentially downloads. If I open that notebook, it is essentially contacting the GitHub repository. You don't have to change anything here. Um, the repository that I pointed out earlier containing the code, it goes there, downloads the data folder from there, and then changes the data uh, like folder structure of the data present so that I can read it as an external table of Hive. I simply created a database called a spam reviews. And I have also created an external table called spam reviews or spam reviews raw with a single column on it called, called review. I also put in a comment and I have partitioned it by the review polarity and the source and label. Once I had run this section, a raw table that is queryable by me is available to me. So I select a star from spam review. So as soon as I run it, it returns ar around 932 records and I can see all the labels and uh, the data that is present. In production environment, when I'm setting this up, I would use a Databricks auto loader and what auto loader provides me is a mechanism to monitor automatically any new file that or record that is dropped into my cloud storage. And it manages in the background all the queuing services and triggers so that it, as soon as the data set, a new data arrives in my raw location or my landing zone, it is processed by the downstream pipeline. So keep that in mind. You can read more about it by clicking on this link. Next, I will also be using the Delta Lake. And as I mentioned earlier, Delta Lake provides you with asset transactions. It unifies the batch and streaming source and sync. So it provides you with a single API to perform all those operations into your environment or into your data pipeline. It also enforces a schema and you can also evolve schema over time. You also have history of what changes were made into the Delta table and it provides you with the versioning, data versioning. So today we will also be using Delta in this presentation. So here, in order to create my bronze Delta table, I simply create another table, spam review Delta bronze. And the only difference here is I need to use using Delta instead of using CSV or using Parquet. And I can simply run my SQL command within the same notebook saying that select row number over and all the reviews that I have in my row in my raw table, I'm just giving them a serial number and then copying it into a Delta table. So now my table is in Delta format and I can run the command select serial number review and label from spam reviews dot bronze table order by serial number. So here, as you can see, I ran the query and overall I'm able to read it much faster than I last did it in my, when the data was in CSV format or text format. So querying it almost took around 20 seconds. And when I converted it into Delta format, just by making that switch between the text and Delta, my performance improved. I haven't done any compaction or any other optimization here. As you can see, the total count of the records here is not much. It's 1600, but this will be helpful in proving out our end-to-end -end pipeline. So now what have we achieved? We have already taken the raw data sets which are available in text format from a landing zone and convert it into a clean delta format. The next step will be to perform feature engineering, which is if there are any categorical columns into my data set, then converting them into numeric and one hot encode them. I would also have to make sure that I separate out my test and train data sets so that when I train my machine learning models, they don't cause any data leakage. And lastly, because my data set has a label called as fake or uh, true, I will also have to convert that into a numeric variable because machine learning algorithms only understand numerics. 
So in the next steps, I have done exactly that. So here I divided the data set into train and test. I separated out the features from the target variable. Now working specifically for the, uh, for the feature variable. Here, if my data set have any categorical columns, it will convert it into numeric and one hot encode them. The main feature that we have to work on is the review itself, because review contains all the text uh, or the words that the user and user or the fake review reviewer has written. So we need to convert it into a format that is understandable by the machine learning or NLP algorithms. So this is where Spark NLP is really handy because it provides you with a lot of scalable scalable algorithms implemented and fully compatible with the Spark ML so that you can use, you can stack one stage after another of processing and ultimately create a pipeline model. If you're coming from SK learn background, you must be familiar with that. It is very similar in concept and you will see in it in a bit. So here, first of all, I'm defining which column of my input data set is my document. So document is essentially a document assembler tells Spark NLP that this is my, like this column every record is a document and any uh, operation down the line that I'm performing will be on this document. So this is the how we initialize it and create a document um, column and we call it document assembler. Next, we do the tokenization. Tokenization essentially means taking this text document that we have defined and converting it into individual tokens. Afterwards, we take the tokens, like the individual words that have been created from dividing the document and remove the stop words like a and the for etc, which are just used to make a language more understandable, but they don't add any more value to our machine learning algorithm. So we do that. We use a pre-trained model from provided by Spark NLP, so that's a great uh, benefit of using Spark NLP as well, that since I'm using English language here, it has pre-trained models for that. Remove the punctuations, so and keep only the alphanumeric characters. This is for this is where normalization comes in. So I'm using the normalizer again provided by Spark NLP, and then taking the clean tokens and normalized, and setting all the tokens as lowercase. And ultimately, like we lemmatize it so that all the words that we have are reduced into their lemmatized form. For example, if you are having words like running, ran, run, rans, they will all be reduced to run or to their base form. And lastly, we create a finished, col uh, finished column or lemmatized column that takes all the lemmatized tokens and then combine them into an array. Now, once I have this lemmatized data, uh, lemmatized array for each of the document, I will create a count vectorizer. So what count vectorizer will tell me is a matrix that lists out all the unique words that are available in my corpus. So corpus being the six, whatever documents I have in my training data set, and it will create a dictionary out of it and tell me exactly how many times a word appeared in a document. Now I'll use that to convert to co get the inverse document frequency. And lastly, in order to make our computation more um, efficient, we are using a L2 norm normalizer. This is different from the normalizer we used earlier because this is a vector normalizer. So this is different from the NLP, Spark NLP normalizer. And ultimately we create a pipeline model. Here in the stages, we take all the different components that are there and add them. And ultimately this is what our pipeline model looks like. When I execute it, you can see that there, it will perform 
each and every step and at the end of it, I get the feature engineering pipeline ready for me to use. Now the second step is to process the label column. So my label column is the one which contains the, whether it's fake or it's correct, if the review is fake or correct. So here I'm converting that using a string indexer to convert that into a zero or one. So label indexer estimator. So I created that. And then I fit on the training data set as well as on the test data set. So this is more like a Spark ML concept that when I say string indexer or an estimator, an estimator is something that learns from the data that is provided. So here string indexer looks at the column in my data set, input a label column and understands how many categories are there. And then when it learns, it encodes, when I do an actual fit on the training train underscore y, it returns something called as a transformer. The input of a transformer is actually, when I process something through a transformer, it returns another transformed data frame. So fit by itself is not returning me a data frame, but when I use the transformer and call the transform com command on my data frame, then it gives me the binarized column. So now if I look at it, the schema for binary test Y and binary text, uh, binarized train and test Y, you will see another column here called label index, which is of type double. And my original label was of type string. So here I'm combining my feature engineer date training DF. So here my original training data set had the review column. So I join it with the binarized train Y. And then I also join my test X, which is the non-processed text review and I join it, join it with my binarized test Y. And I create a new final data frame. So now I have, I am done with the feature engineering part. So I'll now move on to the train and classification model. Let me execute these steps so that they are available for us when I, when I run the machine learning model training. Okay. I'll have to run it from the top. Because every time I restart my cluster, I'll have to run this step of percent pip install and the library that is needed. That's something to keep in mind. Whereas if I have a cluster scope library attached to a cluster, then I won't have to do this step every time. So there's a pro and con for uh, using the percent pip. Okay. I'll wait for it to run. Let's see what's the error. Data is not defined. Okay. So this is coming because I didn't run the command to read the my entire data set earlier. So now my data dot count will return the actual count. And once my data frame has the data, I should be able to import the libraries, divide it into test and train, one hot encode if there is any categorical column. But in this, in this demo, I didn't remove, I removed all the uh, like except for the actual review i don't have any other categorical column so this will not produce any additional column otherwise i would have uh, created more categorical converted more categorical variables or features into numeric and at the end combined them into my feature vector so right now my feature vector is essentially if i look at it like Let's see. My feature vector will be the sparse vex. That this will be the column that contains all my features. Okay. 
I can always check what my combined feature engineer training data frame looks like. So I can just do either a Databricks display command or I can do a head command as well. So as you can see here, it has the unprocessed text review and the label index. So here, the reason I'm using this, uh, we created the feature pipeline, like feature processing pipeline earlier. And here, when we are trying to use, uh, uh, create our feature data set that we will, or the process data set that we'll be using for training, it doesn't have the processed uh, reviews. The reason is the pipeline, when we run it through our pipeline model, ultimately it will take each and every row and make it go through all the steps that we define. So here, when we talked about tokenization and normalization and also each and every row that we have here will actually go through all that process. And ultimately we will receive that when we, um, when we fit the model and we predict, it will automatically make it go through all that exercise. And this is good because when I'm thinking about deployment of this model, at that time, my data input will be in a string format. It won't be in a vector format. So that's why I made the input because whatever I am going to use here as my training data set will be the format that the model down the line will expect when you are trying to make a prediction. So this is a very important point to keep into consideration. So now the last step for me is essentially training the classification model. So here, as you can see, I'm going to use MLflow. And MLflow, just to recap, was the framework that has components to track your MLflow li model lifecycle in an end-to-end -end fashion. So here, in Databricks environment, you see experiments. If you click on that, it actually shows you all the machine learning model training that you are doing the hyperparameters that you are using, if you log the model itself into your MLflow experiment or run, then it will display that. And you can also compare multiple runs of the, of the model training with different hyperparameters. So as a result, if you are doing this in production and doing a hyperparameter tuning using hyperopt or maybe cross validator, you can actually see multiple runs and ultimately compare them and get the best model. So MLflow provides you with that capability. So here I am just creating a new MLflow experiment. So experiment is essentially the project that I am working on. And within each experiment, the number of times I log the model training and the output, it becomes my model run. So as soon as I say, uh, here I'm just creating a new experiment. So if I run this, it will clear any other, if I had an experiment with the name, like here I am ex exporting my username and then as prefix and then adding spam review classifier as my experiment name. And I'm also saying that this experiment location is slash users slash, and here I'm adding the user and MLflow experiment name. So when I run this, if I go back into my workspace and I will be able to see the experiment listed here. And if I click here, it will actually show me more details around, around where this notebook, uh, this experiment was generated from. So here, as you can see, this is my, this is just a plain experiment. And right now it doesn't have any run because I didn't log any uh, ML model training or output here. So if I go back, I'm going to train a logistic regression model from the pyspark.ml.classification. So you can read more about the different available hyperparameters here for it and how to utilize it. I'm also going to use the multi-class classification evaluator. And if I was doing a hyperparameter tuning, I could have used cross validator and param grid builder. But in this example, I have not, I'm going to use a single set of hyperparameters just to give you an example. 
So here I define a logistic regression with features column. Remember, it was a Spark VEX that was created. Uh, that will be created at the end of my pipeline model uh, when it is applied to uh, input data frame. And the label column is essentially the label in underscore index. So this is my target feature. The number of iterations I have said is 30. So here my model final estimator is essentially pipeline and the stages I have set up is feature engineering pipeline, the initial one that I did, plus the logistic regression that I defined. So these are again estimators. And remember when we have an estimator, we have to fit it in order to get a transformer and the transformer is then applied to the machine, uh, to the data set to get the predictions. So now here, I'm simply taking my evaluator, which is the multi-class classification evaluator. My prediction column is prediction and my label column is label underscore index. And the metric I'll be looking at is the F1 score. So here I'm just saying auto log to start the logging of my ML model training. Here again, I first fit my model on the combined feature training data frame. And this returns a model transformer. Now, as soon as I have the transformer, I can then transform my combined training data frame and the combined test data frame. So now once I transform it, since I had the logistic regression as the last stage in my pipeline model, I can now have a column called as prediction. So if I look at the, if I run this, it will actually show me that there are columns called as prediction because now the last step in my pipeline model was actually logistic regression. So it looked at the input column that we defined the spark vex and then the label column label index and made a prediction whether it's a zero or a one based on the training data set. And that is by default called a prediction column. And if I go and look at my experiments tab, I can see that my test F1 score and training F1 score have been logged. And so it looks like my processing just finished. And ultimately I also see a model, Spark model that is also logged into my MLflow tracking server. On clicking on it, I'm directed to my managed tracking server on Databricks environment. So here I have option to go in and reproduce a run. So essentially think about it. If you want to reproduce everything that we did, like with a particular set of hyperparameters and produce the same result that de with Delta's versioning, the, there is capability that you can run this exact notebook with the same set of parameters to reproduce a run. So this gives you complete reproducibility. I also see a source. So essentially I can, if I click on it, it will show me the exact version of the notebook from where this run was created within my experiment and what was the version of my notebook. It has the path value where my data set is and ultimately, or my artifacts are. And if I look at in the artifacts tab here, I can actually see all the different files that are present. So uh, as you can see, my actual model information is there. What is the artifact path, the runtime that was used. And if I have to create a Python function from this ML model, then what will be needed? The conda.yaml file also contains the information about the different libraries that I need to be having into my environment. So with this kind of abstraction, you can easily recreate this run on a remote computer as well. So a developer can actually download this con this project or this MLflow project from the run, from the tracking server and run, the, run it on their local machine as well because the Conda will recreate this entire environment with all dependencies for them to run. Now for the next step of productionizing, I click on this model and here I get an option to register. So as soon as I register the model, this model is, I can give it a name and now 
I, if I click on the models tab on the left hand side, I can actually see that my new model is available for me to move from one environment to another. Um, and by environment, I mean like production, I can perform, I can set up alerts on the life cycle of the model and also govern who can promote my model from one environment to another. So here I have two active versions or the version number two is not in any stage, but it's registered there. I can set it up into a staging environment saying promote to staging. This can be automated through an API or I can keep the human in the loop to understand why someone wants to promote this uh, code to the next stage. And after promoting it and understanding like understanding the description where this model promotion is coming from, I can approve, reject or cancel. As soon as I approve, I can have multiple versions of the model in staging and I can run A-B test on them based on that. MLflow also have documentation to log schema of your machine learning model, like so that you can log a sample input record that can be used to query this data model machine learning model and also the signature. So if a particular data set doesn't match the signature, it will throw an error. So from here, if I go back into my registered models, registered model into my environment, I can then also click on enable serving. So what this gives me, this is one way of how I can serve my machine learning model. So essentially clicking on it enables me to create a REST endpoint and my model will be deployed and I can call it through a REST API and it will return a zero or one value to me. So this is just one way of creating a or deploying your machine learning model end to end on the Databricks platform, going all the way from raw data ingestion to data cleaning to feature engineering and ultimately model training and deployment and putting monitoring around it. So as you can see here, I don't have permission, but if I had permission, I can simply deploy it and have these API examples to query my endpoint and this machine learning model will be deployed. So just to wrap it all up, in today's presentation, we went over the how you can create an end-to-end -end machine learning capable pipeline at scale using Databricks and Jon Snow Labs NLP to detect spam reviews. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach me on my LinkedIn or my email. And uh, thank you for attending this talk.